I'm a feminist, but I don't know how to bleed a radiator, and I don't want to know how. <laughs> Stick your passive-aggressive posters up your ass. I'm a Couldn't feminist. Couldn't give a fuck. I'm a feminist, but I'm not really sure what bleeding a ra- radiator is. I don't know what's in it. I don't know what people are doing when they say Leave they're bleeding Leave it to the stepdads. <laughs> I'm not interested. But what even is it? I don't... I mean, don't answer. <laughs> no, it makes your heating more efficient. Yeah, like, that. It's hypocritical. It, it's hypocritical. If you care it. about the old planet... Oh, no, I want someone to do it. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want my radio radio is unbled, because I know it matters yes. <laughs> to <laughs> the environment and to the heat of my house. Employ a stepdad. Yeah, but I don't want to do it myself, and I don't want to know what the mechanism... What's... I don't, I don't know really what's in a radiator. I'm bored talking about it this long. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but if something unfeminist happens to me, I immediately write it in my notes on my phone because I need a lot of these, right? So any time something I think, oh, that's an I'm a feminist, but I have to quickly jam it in my phone because otherwise I'll forget it, right? Um, and then when I come to a show, I look in the notes and go, oh, yeah, that happened. Um, and uh, I'm a feminist, but tonight I looked in the notes on my phone and it said, I'm a feminist, but Travis Alabanza, my glove box sounds like a euphemism for my vagina. And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I carry them round, and clearly Travis Alabanza and I were joshing. Something came up about my glove box. <laughs> I don't have a car, so I don't know why. No. But don't Travis need a car to have a glove I, box, am I right? Travis, no, it didn't I, work. I, I mean, tra- they still have glove boxes, even though no one wears gloves anymore. That's true. Yeah, uh, no, it, that box is for um, quality street collisions bars that yes. you've hoarded, knowing that they were a Christmas limited time item. Yeah. And there are four in there, four in the boot, and four in a pink cabinet in my. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's not a the... euphemism either. There is a pink cabinet in my hall. <laughs> Um, well, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I know. So, you know the best two quality street are the purple one and also the green triangle. Oh, yeah. They brought out a bar this year just for Christmas. Oh. And it's a big bar where the bottom half is the green one and the what? top half is a miniature... Stop it right now. Yeah. I'm going to need you to stop that right now. No they one told me about that. work on the PR for this. I'm doing it all for what? free. <laughs> you, you never dropped it's me a text. What think about... Well, would it have killed you to drop I, me a WhatsApp? With I a thought I was up? just spread. I was just. I just posted stories day in day out. I didn't see them, but this is a disappointment. <sighs> well, you can't buy any anymore because I've bought them all in South East London anyway. <laughs> but I know if I break into your car, there'll be one in every orifice. Yeah. <laughs> of the car, which now sounds like another euphemism for my vagina. And we've we're got back. glove box, pink cabinet, orifice of car, yeah. car orifice. Yeah. Oh, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, um, but um, despite the fact that I consider myself to be liberal, egalitarian, and and compassionate, Mm -hmm. also, Mm -hmm. on the other hand, these days, Mm. I genuinely believe Mm. that if you drop litter, you shouldn't be allowed to use the NHS. (laughs) Suck it. Wow. Swivel. I mean it. Yeah, don't give a fuck. You shouldn't. Seems like a popular move. Uh, I'm a feminist, but it's uh, Martin Luther King Day, and I realise as it comes to an end, the only thing that I have posted about Martin Luther King Day is uh, Hari Kondabolu saying... Harry Bolu being a brilliant comedian, saying, I also have dreams. Quote, some white people when Martin Luther King was alive. MLK Day. Okay, his joke is really funny and I clearly didn't sell it well. Okay. <laughs> All right. What Harry Kondabolu was saying was, white people when Martin Luther King was alive would have gone, but I also have dreams. You're not the only one with a dream. All lives matter. It's a really good joke that yeah. Harry's done there. <laughs> clearly I should have done more... You know, proper MLK content and I have failed to do that and I can I take this one back and do a different one because yeah. everyone hates it this whole it's room it's a bit strong it just 
It hasn't landed. It landed on its side. <laughs> but it hasn't hurt itself. I'm a feminist, but I often feel like I land on my side and yeah. I try and style it out. Me too. And tonight, I feel like the most feminist thing I can do is go, I've landed on my side. Yeah. I'm not styling it out. I'm not turning it into something it's not. Yeah. I am who I am. It is what it is. It's still January. There's still time for me to turn this puppy around. <laughs> I'm going to roll this puppy over. <laughs> This puppy, I'm going to put this puppy on its feet and take it for a special little walk. A special little walk around a feminist block. This is what I'm doing. By the end of January, I will have taken that little puppy for a little walk around a feminist block. Up until I, it's only mid-January. I don't even have to have done anything good yet. I've no, what are you worried about? Well, I'm just saying, I've t I'm very harsh on myself. Who else is harsh on themselves? <laughs> Who else is kinder to other people in their minds than they are to themselves? <laughs> Actually, you're, uh, you're, you're my crew. All right, I'll meet you all <laughs> in the Snog Yogurt and Chalk Farm after this. That's a place that's not, again, <laughs> she's not inviting me to her glove box. There's a, there's a shop called Snog Yogurt. Snog Yogurt, yeah. I don't even know. That. I think the Chalk Farm one might be gone now. I don't think this is a joke. Go on. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I've written it now. I'm a feminist, but despite, despite the fact that I talk the talk about giving precious little to zero shits about what I look like, that is a lie, because these days, um, it's probably a bit of perimenopause, but when I get stressed, just a chunk of hair just falls out of my head. <gasps> and um, I care about it so much, it feels like someone's pulled a bit of my personality off. I don't know if you've read the Philip Pullman books, the Northern Lights trilogy, they've no. been around for a long old time, but in that, the characters have a daemon, and it's like an extended bit of their personality that's like a, an ethereal creature, and when it gets cut off occasionally, which is like the worst thing you could do to someone, mm -hmm. and they're left mm -hmm. like a f kind of lobotomized, essentially. Mm. If, it, I have a little moment of feeling, I have like such an enormous reaction every time it happens. I thought I'd just say it on here, there's no jokes in this. I just thought, actually, maybe that's something that's happening to loads of people. It's not full on alopecia, I don't, I don't know. But like oh, just a bit of hair will fall out and I fucking care so much. And then I have a wave of shame and feminist guilt at caring so much. Oh, yeah. At something that genuinely matter. matters in no way. Yeah. What's not affecting anything? I'm so fucking lucky. How yeah. dare I care this much about something that at this point I can hide. Like, yeah, no joke, sorry. No, honestly, it's, it's not a lot of fun being a woman, is it? No. I mean, that, that, that I shouldn't feel bad about... I feel bad about my body because I've been patriarchally changed, changed, uh, trained to. Oh, I shouldn't feel bad because now we've all got to love it, all of our bodies all the time. No, yeah. no, you don't have to love your body. You've just got to accept that it's a fact and not feel anything about it now, I've read. Oh, no, but I do want to love my body. Well, you shouldn't. Well, I tried, but yeah. now I can't. And I like, do I love it or I don't love it? And well, everyone it is impossible, on Instagram tells it? you and a like, different thing. And they're like, well, aim for neutrality. Aim for neutrality then. Aim for neutrality. And they're like, oh, I forgot to look in a mirror for a month. <laughs> Yeah. It was nice, but I've turned up with fucking eight twigs in my hair, fucking <laughs> bit of lipstick around my fucking nostrils. Like, yeah. where's the line? Where's the line? I did write a joke. Um, uh, what's awful, I think, about the hair falling out is how cruel is it that it's stress that causes it, but it happening makes you feel so stressed. Uh, it's like developing a peanut allergy that presents as your lips turning into a Snickers bars. <laughs> it's not my greatest work, but I couldn't... <laughs> Leave the whole bit on just an earnest sentiment. No. I get it. Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Woo! Shop presents the Guilty Factors with me, Never Francis White, guest co-host Jessica Costco, our very special guest, Dr. Kirsty Sedgman, talking about being unreasonable. Now, if you're listening to this episode, what you won't know is we recorded another episode tonight where comedian Olga Koch taught us how to make goals and stick to them. And uh, basically, you lie and say you've already done it. Um, so we call this Olga Koch's I've already done it. I haven't really. But now I've said it. I have to do it. Um, so has any? I told the audience in the interval uh, to say to each other, 
I've done it, yeah, like this morning. Yeah, actually, funnily enough, this morning, I sent off for the application for my master's. Or you could say, actually, this morning, I received a uh, letter saying, your master's is uh, your master's is through. I mean, you don't have to fully lie to everyone you know to play this game. You can play it where they know you're playing it, or you can say, yeah, yeah, yeah I've already done it. You know, so what I wouldn't say is I've just been elected MP for Kensington, Chelsea, and then they go, they find out, and they think you're a liar. But if you said I've already, I've turned, I've called up to ask about what I'd have to do to run for my local council, thinking well, I haven't. But if I say I have, it'll be really awkward when they go, well, did you hear back? Um, uh, or you could even say I've got a meeting about it. And then you have got a meeting about it because you're quickly going to get a meeting about it so you don't look like a liar. So that's the idea. But here we can play big. So you can say whatever you fucking like, okay? Because we all know you're playing the game. If everyone knows you're playing the game, I think you can play it as wildly as you want. Um, okay, all right. Who has got one that they would like to do? Great. What's your name? Phoenix. Phoenix, excellent. Big round of applause for Phoenix. <laughs> We have taken our political burlesque show to Edinburgh. <gasps> How did it go? Uh, it was amazing. Everyone loved it. <laughs> Excellent. And your political burlesque show, what's it called? Stripping in the name of. Stripping in the name of. <laughs> wow. And so it's a political burlesque show, like a feminist burlesque show? Yeah. Excellent. And uh, off the back of Edinburgh, have you got any further runs booked now? Well, we'll probably go to America. <laughs> you probably go to America. <laughs> I, I think we're going to do a guest spot at your show in Edinburgh as well. Oh, yeah. you're doing a guest show? Yeah. Did of you know, course you are. You? Yeah, hello. Of course you are. I, I know about that. I know about that. Well, it's great that you've already inquired about booking an American tour. That's fantastic. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, stripping in the name of. Big round of for. Um, anyone else got one? Something I've already definitely done. Just a, ha hand the mic back there. What's your name? Natasha. Uh, what, so what have you already done, Natasha? Um, definitely I've, already I've done just, it. I've just been offered a uh, highly paid, socially conscious feminist job in Australia. And I'm moving there next year. Wow. <laughs> Do you, what, what's the job? Uh, it involves... <laughs> um, growing vegetables and making, reforming agriculture to make it better for the environment wow that's a that's a what a fantastic thing to be doing definitely i love that and it's really going to change the world and it's going to change your how you feel about your place in the world so it's such a wonderful yeah. thing and i'm glad it's already sorted um and i look forward to next time you come along to the show i look forward to hearing about how that's moved on yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm excited. great anybody else who else wants the mic yes go uh, I just managed to get a producer for my new screenplay about a woman who doesn't want to have children. Oh, <laughs> a, a screenplay, woman. and you've got a produce, you've got a production company lined up. Are they any yeah, good? Yeah, they're, they're they're wonderful, and we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go global with this. Mm. It's gonna be have great. they made anything um, that's won anything or that we would have heard of? Uh, they made the King's speech. Oh, <laughs> wow. Oh, they made the king. I think that, is that left bank? I feel like that might be left bank. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. That's absolutely great. Anybody else? Anybody else got? We're so many successful people. Yes, great. I'm actually over my ex, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not in love with him anymore. And, and uh, I've just realised that I, I do deserve better. Yeah. Yes, I, <laughs> yes you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, and yes, you are. Yes, you are. Anyone else got some people? Someone had the one there. Just shout yours out, and I'll say it to the mic. I've got a meeting um, with the BBC and Netflix. I've got a meeting with the BBC and Netflix. Yes. About my book, they want to do. About your book, bid. they want to do what? A bid. Uh, you know, uh, a bid. They want to. They want a bid for it. Your book about moving to the UK. Restarting my life. Restarting your life. 43 master student taking over the world. 43 master student taking over the world. So you're... Love and life. Love and life. Okay. So you've got a meeting with the BBC and Netflix about turning your already published book into... 
a, a, presumably a show or a movie, or probably probably whatever you want. I mean, I think they really want it, so you can probably set the. Time. <coughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm so excited for you. That's absolutely amazing, and I, I you know I I, uh, I look forward to seeing it. I think it's please. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, there are quite, there are a couple of scripts on my table, but I can't wait to read it, and I I'm sure I'm. I'm sure I'm going to love the part. And uh, Jess Foster I Buster got a part in it as well, did I? I? I think I had a part in it. Did I have a part in it? But like not as a... I'm your fiancé. Amazing. <laughs> Incredible. But, um, and, 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 and as your fiancé in, do I get... And I probably get to play something other than a social worker or a security guard. <laughs> or a tired mum. Oh, I'm just playing myself. Okay. So it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think I can do that. <laughs> what other parts have you got this year, Jess? Oh, coming up. I have got what some. Playing, well, what are you playing? Um, all of that aside, an amazing. My um, turns out my son's a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and that's all the Cox game. I've said it, so it's true. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely game. It's a good game, isn't it's it? Really filled my it's, cockles. I, I think the informal name of it is "I'm over my ex." Yeah, that was. <laughs> Let's an play. I'm over my ex. Drop. Yeah. Let's play. So I'm over good. my ex. This is the Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which uh, undermine uh, them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Jessica Foster Cuba, and we are talking about being unreasonable. And I have a little story mm. I want to share with you. Yum. Okay. I booked some dental work in for a chosen family member that I was like, right, we're getting this sorted. Um, it's a present from me uh, for a, you know, let's let's call it a birthday present. I mean, obviously, I will give them a proper present as well because who wants root canal for their birthday? <laughs> but I was like, you're in pain and dentistry work's really expensive. Yeah. You don't get a lot on the NHS. And I was like, we are just, we're just doing it all. But it was going to be quite a lot. So I rang the receptionist, explained the whole thing, and said, "Can I? You know, dental work's very traumatic. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily want to go. If he's only seen for this and not for that, he might not go back. All of that." So I had a long chat with the receptionist, really understanding and sympathetic, and got that I I was don't please don't bill them, bill me, and so on and so on. So on. Anyway, had to ring back to change the appointment, so on and so on. So, on. Um, so we really had bonded by this point. Then she says. Um, I'll send you a payment link and if you, you've got to pay 50 quid to hold the appointment. And I was like, great. And so this is really important that it happens. I'll pay it straight away. Did pay it straight away. The next day, I got a text saying, you haven't paid, so we've cancelled the appointment. Oh. And I was really upset. And I rang up and I said, um, hey, um, I definitely have paid. I've got a text from you saying I've paid and I've got the receipt. that you know They sent you like an email receipt or whatever. Um, I've paid and you've cancelled my appointment. And she said, well, it's not here under the name. And blah, blah, blah. I said, but I did say different na appointment name to credit card name. And, um, and she immediately went, and I just said, I don't think this is a very good process. Like, I think you should text people first if you don't pay by this point. Mm -hmm. have, if you haven't paid, if you have paid, let us know. And if you don't, I think that could be, the, <coughs> that would be a better text to send. And I was a little bit upset but it was more I was upset for the family member thinking oh no it's going to get cancelled and they've taken time off work and I was just like yeah. agitated but I wasn't makes it more stressful than it wasn't was cross with her I was saying I don't think it's a very good process because I assumed it was like an automatic text and she said well I'm happy to cancel the appointment and I went but what why would you cancel the appointment I said no 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 I really want the appointment and she said well I've asked for what the other name on the credit card was and she was really I, like immediately went into I'll cancel the appointment you know you're being rude to me blah blah and I said look I'm not being rude I'm not being rude I'm saying I don't think it's a very good process and I said I think I think it's rude to charge someone 50 quid send them a receipt and then say they haven't paid and you're gonna like what if I hadn't seen this text he would have turned up I have paid for something you're not even refunding it to me I have to chase after you to get a refund like mm. like it's it is, it is your error and as much as, you know, I'm not blaming you personally, but I feel like it's not a good process, and that's all I was saying. Anyway, she eventually just said, well, I'm going to hang up on you now. <gasps> and I had 
sort I I de-escalated enough to sort it and at the end I just said I just think it's nice to say sorry if you know made in mystery of error I'm you know and I really was saying I'm not blaming you but I just think it basically I was saying I think we got off on the wrong foot here and escalated gave her that opportunity and she said well I'm hanging up now so I then wrote an email to and said could I please speak to the practice manager and I got an email back saying what would you like to talk about and I just said oh it's just a customer service thing and I got an email back saying, um, okay, um, you're probably going to have to send pictures of your teeth. <laughs> no, but, well, she didn't know who I was. Uh, but, and I didn't know it was her either. We both didn't know we were talking to each other. Because then I wrote back and said, no, 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 I had, I had this and this and this happen. I, I didn't say what it was. I just said an upsetting customer service experience. Mm. And she wrote back and said, well, that was with me, so I can't really help you with that. But the practice manager's away till next week, so you can talk to a senior dentist. I said, or we can cancel the, defer the appointment. I went, no, 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 no. I said, I just need to know that they're going to be treated with respect and professionalism. And, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll chat to the practice manager next week. Anyway, um, she said, yes, I can make sure that. Anyway, I had a lovely, lovely, lovely chat to the practice manager the following week, and I said, look, here's what I think happened. I think probably being a receptionist is quite hard, and especially when people are in pain with their teeth. Possibly, probably, someone had been rude to her or snapped at her or shouted at her because they hadn't paid for their appointment and got cancelled and she was having a really bad day. And it just felt like another in a series of people blaming her. But I know that I said process and I know, because I sometimes work with corporate people around how to de-escalate these things. I said, I know that I said it's process. And I was a bit upset, but I definitely wasn't shouting. I wasn't raising my voice. I wasn't sweary. I wasn't, I was just going, hey, I feel really upset that, you know, you and I had a long conversation about this person. So you knew, she said, and she said at the time, well, my, my, my colleague called you yesterday. And I said, I did get a missed call, but from an unknown number and no message. So then you need to just, if you can send a text saying it's cancelled, you can send a text saying, have you paid? And if you haven't, please pay. Otherwise we're going to cancel it. Anyway, our practice manager said, look, I don't want to get anyone in trouble. She's probably had a really bad day, but I would like to talk to you about process and I'd like to talk to you about how she can de-escalate things if a customer's upset because I had told her it was going to be a lot of work and it's your, she, this practice manager owns the practice and I said, it's going to be thousands of pounds. And I said, so I think you would not want me, because I could have just hung up and gone, go, I'll go somewhere else then. Yeah. But I didn't, because I'd read all these amazing reviews and it was in the right place and everything. Anyway, the practice manager was so nice and said, I'm so sorry it's happened. And I said, look, could you just tell her, it'd be really nice if she just said, even if she just says, I'm sorry, we got off on the wrong foot. She went, I will, because, you know, and let me get to the bottom of it. Anyway, they've since gone in and had their, yeah. their open their starter for 10. Yeah. And I've since had the receptionist messaging. She's never said sorry. She's never said sorry. And the work's all booked in her way. And I just desperately want her to say, yeah. oh, I'm sorry about the other day. That's not unreasonable. I am so livid. Even if she is personally raging and doesn't believe that she's sorry, mm. in a professional context like that, if it's exactly as you described, she needs to eat shit and say sorry. <laughs> But that's what life, there's so but, many but, times but, in life where you're like, well, actually, as part of my job, yeah. is to fucking apologise when I fuck my job up. Well, I, I, but what's her side of the story? Because she must Whether have Whether you had one. a good reason for having done it or not. But this is the thing, is I, you're only hearing my side of the story. I bet her side of the story is a really rude yeah, woman. Yeah, I had the up, worst day ever. Shouting was at me. Someone, yeah. And it wasn't my fault. Well, I didn't know that the credit card had a different name. She did because I told her it would be a different person. But anyway, let's not dwell on that. Um, but I was just like, it's a payment link. It shouldn't need to be the same name. It's a payment link. It's been paid. Anyway, I thought I did such a good job of saying to the dentist, please tell her. I, you know, you we did all honestly, have bad if days. I was in that situation, we all have bad I'm... days. These things happen. Everyone screws up. I'm sure I've acted unreasonably because I've been in a bad way at that exact point in time and I've just had enough. I, it uh, happens to everyone. When I end up in phone calls like that, Debs, I'm far less contained. <laughs> you have been reasonable. I've got no filter. In situations like that, when I'm going round and round in circles, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, I, you know, I've hurt my feelings, you've hurt your feelings, yeah. can we fix the problem, though? Yep, but can we fix the problem, though? Okay, I'm going to list everything I can think of to be sorry for, and now can we fix the problem, though? Once yeah. I've done about three of them, I just start saying what I really feel. Right, yeah. I start saying things like, Do I? Oh, okay. I'm going, I want to... 
this is making me want to self harm. <laughs> Does oh! I mean, making noises like that at, at her. feel i'm sure her story is oh some title you're making me want to kick a dog <laughs> do you know the funny if part i develop an addiction <laughs> it's <a> today <laughs> you did that part of this is is one of the things that the practice manager who is the senior dentist there as well said mm. to me is um, we got chatting and she asked me what I did and I told her and because uh, I was talking about maybe getting a little bit of you know just these teeth have shifted and I said oh maybe it races and I said I wouldn't really care but sometimes I perform on screen and I really notice it then and I know that's a bit vain and blah blah and she said what do you do and I said I'm a comedian she went oh god we've given you a lot of material haven't we and I went no I would never <laughs> 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 I haven't named it. <laughs> I can't name it. No, they've got really good reviews. Let's not, you know. They, it's a, we it's won't a be able to find them from the fact that they've got really good reviews. There's no way anyone could ever identify no. the dental. No. I really want to say to this receptionist, because it's going to be a long relationship, right? Because this person in my chosen family yeah. has to go for loads of different things. Yeah. And now I, I really love the practice manager. I want to go in. Do I say to the practice manager, it's really bothering me that she's never just reached out and said, sorry, even, yes. if, even if it's just yeah. like, sorry, we got off on the wrong foot, which I've given her that out. She, I've said, she can just say, sorry, we got off on the wrong foot so that I feel comfortable about coming in. But I've talked about now having a little bit of work there. I'm like, it's... No, you're not having a little bit of work there. Should I write back? But I love the practice manager. Should I write to the receptionist and just say, hey... It bothers no. me. Or I think I hey to is too manager? informal. You keep opening these things with hey. What? That's, what's, that's, that's, that's how Steph says hey. Go? When I wake up in the night freezing and I take the covers back, she goes, in her sleep, hey. <laughs> you can't, it's, you've got to be more empowered than a hey. I, and should like, I say anything or should I just let it the fuck go? Because I'm one of the... Yeah, bitch. <laughs> Who, okay. Don't if you think I should let it go, <laughs> shout frozen. And if you think... If you think I no should take to. action, shout action. Okay. Action! 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 Okay. Oh, Just hear the frozen. Frozen. Action! Action! Oh, there's more frozen. Okay, I'm letting it go. On the. I have to listen to my audience, otherwise, who am I? All right. Jessica Foster Q, will you do some stand-up for okay. us? Okay. Please, under the stage, the incredible Jessica Foster Q. Um, okay, so it's some very recent thoughts. I don't, I don't know if they're funny. I was going to say and I don't care, but I do. <laughs> I hope they are. Um, okay, so I posted a... Uh, I'm posting reels of old stand-up on Instagram at the moment in a more prolific way than I would normally because I have a tour to promote and um, I posted a reel um, at the start of the year on purpose um, with an old bit of stand-up um, I did which um, I still stand by now about the diet industry um, and the gist of it is um, this is a short okay anyway it's basically 98% of diets restrictive diets eating diets don't work um 98 so it, it, it's not your fault if you can stick to one um 98 of people couldn't um which means it's safe to say as a thing if 98 of the thing doesn't work it doesn't work uh they don't work if 98 of cars didn't work you wouldn't fucking get in one would you um <laughs> let alone buy and get in a new one every single monday and go <laughs> 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 What's wrong with me? <laughs> and um, and I posted this at the start of January because of all the horrible noise in the world to try anyway at these things. Um, uh, and the reel does quite well. What can I say? It's diet season, aka the the month of positive festive shame, post festive shame. Um, and with all the pleasure um, that comes of a reel doing well, inevitably it comes a bit of pain. And sure as eggs is eggs, my comments and my DMs uh, fill up with a lot of. Um, actually all in this instance if they are who they're 
profile looks like they are white cis thin or athletic men desperate to explain to me um that ha 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 ha, nice joke but obviously diets do work that's just thermodynamics um and they all explain to me thank god for this man um (laughs) thank god i mean they all just explained they said if less calories go into your body than you burn you lose weight (laughs) bang science fact psych (laughs) calories in versus calories out mic drop (laughs) 40 years I didn't (laughs) what have I been doing I'm going to have to tell the other heavy people (laughs) oh my god um and, 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 and I, it got me thinking, right? And it got me raging. And then it got me thinking of the back of the, of the simmering, when the rage went from boiling down to the simmering. On the surface of it, how can you argue with that? Calories in versus calories out. That is just science, right? Wrong! Because as soon as you begin to consider any sort of context at all, it fails to work. And um, for me, it's similar to saying, um, the faster you drive, the quicker you'll arrive. You kind of can't argue with it on paper. Um, It's a lovely sound bite. The faster you drive, the quicker you'll get there. Science. Until you consider any sort of context at all. Take any look quicker than a blink at this, and you'll realise that sentence only works if there is only one road to take. It's a totally straight road with no bends, no bumps or imperfections at all. There are no other vehicles, no roadworks or indeed pavements, humans, animals, buildings, God forbid schools or parks or events, no other occurrences anywhere near the road. It's just a dead straight road in a void in space and time with zero obstacles or distractions of any sort. Weather doesn't exist. We've all got exactly the same car that's in exactly the same condition. We've all got the identical driving skills to one another, the same experience of driving and all our bodies and minds are in exactly the same condition and the same day the same mood same energy and focus capacity same eyesight same everything yeah right it's as simple as that the faster you drive the quicker you'll arrive it's actually as soon as you anyway So get fucked as it as simple as calories in versus calories out. Get fucked to the 98% of people who can't maintain a lifetime in calorie deficit and hunger and misery with their bodies fighting them all the way, the ones who are somehow failing or in the wrong at this time. Fuck every single one of those bros with their one-sentence solutions, not quite the flex they had intended. Just raging, really, rather than comedy. <laughs> But I think, and we'll talk about it a bit with our guest, I think, but when they, this sense of injustice, if somebody comments on something, in the desperation you feel to comment back, and actually, like, it is the greatest act of self-care that you can do, actually, to choose Frozen, I think, actually. Just let it go some of the time. Or wait till your mood's got to simmering point and write a rant that you are, if you're privileged enough to be invited on a lovely podcast, <laughs> you can do a sort of reply all. Amazing. Amazing. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. You have got one last chance to see us in London before I am off on tour to Australia and New Zealand. We will be at King's Place on the 10th of April, where Alison Spittle will be co-hosting. Now, we've got a very important episode Um, We've talked briefly on the podcast already about what's happening with reproductive justice in this country and abortion rights. There are currently three bills, uh, anti-abortion bills, of varying degrees in the House of Lords at the moment. There's a two-way push for and against abortion rights creeping in that we are not really paying attention to. So we have a panel of experts, including Felicia Young from Reproductive Justice Initiative, to talk about that. We also have some other great guests uh, talking about a brand new study about refugees in work. And that's also going to be amazing. But I would like as many people as possible to come out uh, because we need to be talking about, thinking about, campaigning about abortion rights in this country. France has just put it into their constitution. Um, we don't have a constitution. It, we will have a section for Q&A, so you can specifically ask our panel of experts what to do, what's going on, and uh, what's going to happen next. For tickets, go to kingsplace.co.uk and search for Guilty Feminist or go to guiltyfeminist.com and go on live shows. Our tour down under begins 
and we can announce our amazing co-hosts for these shows. On the 11th of May in Auckland, the 14th of May in Wellington, and the 15th of May in Christchurch, I am going to be co-hosting for the first time with the incredible stand-up comedian from Aotearoa, Michelle Accord. I know she's huge in New Zealand and a massive feminist. I'm very, very excited. We tried to work with her before and her daughter very inconveniently gave birth that night. Uh, So um, I can't think of a more feminist reason not to come. So we're very, very excited. Then we'll be in Adelaide on the 18th of May with Geraldine Hickey. After that, we're coming to you, Perth, on the 20th of May with Claire Hooper. Then we'll be in Sydney on the 23rd of May with Geraldine Hickey. And then we'll be in Melbourne on the 25th of May. I am not allowed to say who the co-host is, but she is a big Australian favourite and she's amazing. Um, I am not allowed to announce her yet because she's so famous and fabulous. And the guest is a A-list Australian star. Again, we're just uh, we're just getting permission to announce her. So I would recommend if you're in Melbourne especially... Our tickets are going fast everywhere, but I would recommend if you're in Melbourne, especially you get your tickets now before the announcement is made, because you are going to want to see these people. And we also have some incredible activist voices and other special stuff going on. The last two dates are in Brisbane on the 27th of May with the wonderful Alice Fraser and in Canberra on 28th of May. We end the tour with Kirsty Wiebeck. Grace Petrie's coming out and she's doing all the dates with me. We're also going to have poets, activists, incredible guests. It's going to be, do you remember how buzzy the tour was last time and everyone was hysterical at the end? Uh, It's going to be like that again. So do not miss out. Get tickets now at guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. You can also get an ad-free version of the podcast from Pat. Patreon, Apple Podcasts or Acast Plus from as little as £2.50 a month. And that really helps to support the podcast and pay all the wonderful people who support me in bringing you The Guilty Feminist every week. You can also show support in a way that costs you nothing by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and giving The Guilty Feminist a five-star review, um, even though you've done it before, because it really, really helps other people find us in a very crowded market with a weird algorithm pushing people further to alt-right content every week. And so we'd really, really love it if you'd tell people about it, share it online. And now back to the podcast. Our guest today is an award-winning scholar who has spent her career studying how we construct and maintain competing value systems, working out how people can live side by side in the same world, yet come to understand it in such totally different ways. In her new book on being unreasonable, she examines the outdated rules fraught with discrimination and unfairness that shape our society. Please put your hands together and make incredible whirring noises for the wonderful Dr. Kirsty Sedgman. <laughs> hey, come join Welcome. us. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. Do you have any I'm a Feminist butts? I do. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, come on. So I'm a feminist but <laughs> Yesterday, yeah. I posted a thirst pic of myself on Twitter so that I could poll my followers on whether or not I'm cool enough to pull off wearing a waistcoat. And the poll options were for, respectfully, in parentheses, for, disrespectfully, <laughs> meh, and... Oh, sweetie, no. Ah. And I teach survey design at university. But I should say, I really I should say it was a first pick. What I really mean is it was mildly dehydrated. Voting. Ah. <laughs> what did they vote? What did they go for? They tended to vote for a respectful four, so I will be Very buying nice. a waste hmm. Very nice. I'm a feminist, but I would want a disrespectful four. Yeah, I'm so a feminist, that's what I but I'd be for. like, mm, sort of annoyed about the respect. Mm. <laughs> mm. Indeed, indeed. Um, Kirsty, you've written a fantastic book here about... It's called On Being Unreasonable. Um, And on the back it says, the social contract is collapsing. We're living in an age of division. Bad behavior is everywhere. How do we figure out what's right in a world gone wrong? Why can't we all just be reasonable? And you're an academic. Uh, I was fascinated by the introduction because you tell a story about how you came to sort of think about this in a personal way. Any chance you'd read that to us now? Of course. So it was December 2014, and I was sitting on a bench in the jewellery room of the v Museum, sweating profusely because my entire upper half, from the top of my head down to my waist, was entirely covered by my thick woolen coat. And inside the coat, I was struggling to cram my nipple 
into the mouth of my three-month-old baby, Monty, in order to achieve what the midwives called a good latch. I'd chosen that space because it was dark, there was something to padded to sit on, and I was desperate because Monty's cries had been revving up fast. And around us, there was a swarm of posh, older, white visitors who were pretending to look at the jewels in their cases, but actually tutting and staring askance at the strange woman hiding under a coat in the middle of the room and muttering to each other and asking, should we call security? And now I don't know how many of you have ever breastfed a baby, but it is brutal. So pre-children, this is how I thought it worked. Step one, cradle baby in arm. Step two, with other arm, veil maternal bosom in modest cotton cloth. Step three, pop nipple out, point towards baby. Step four, breastfeeding accomplished. But in reality, in my experience at least, it usually went a bit more like this. So step one, clutching baby, peel nursing bra slowly down. Step two, oh God, it turns out that the bra was the only thing holding the milk in. Milk is now shooting out everywhere. <laughs> Step three, clutching nipple in one hand and baby's neck in the other. Carefully bring them together. Step four, quick as a flash, ram nipple into baby's mouth at precise 45 degree <laughs> upward angle so enough breast tissue gets over his hard palate before he clamps down. Step five, oh, not fast enough. Ow, ow, he's chomped the tip. Step six, gritting teeth retreat. Then try again. Step seven, after a few goes, get it about right and then have to sit there exactly rigid, completely still, so that the latch doesn't slip and leave me white and cracked and bleeding. And then step eight is repeat steps one to seven with boob number two. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but at that exact moment, just a few miles down the road, 40 other women were standing outside Claridge's hotel feeding their own infants. And there were no woolen modesty blankets for them. Just a bunch of signs saying things like, that's what breasts are for, stupid. And in future, I'll be taking my breast at the Ritz, was my <laughs> personal favorite. And that storm in a D-cup was part of a nursing protest that was organized by breastfeeding campaigners, prompted by something that ha happened shortly before where a woman in Claridge's had been asked to cover up her baby with a white tablecloth, and she posted that to Twitter. Nigel Farage got involved, and it, that's when it really hit the headlines because he said, and I quote, um, surely it's not too hard to breastfeed in a way that isn't overly ostentatious. And I because I study discourse, I study language use in action, I became fascinated with this story. So I read all the comments below the line on all the articles, including the Daily Mail, and watching the debates unfurl online, I saw so many of my fellow citizens frothing at the mouth over the idea that they might need to share, uh, one day have to share a space with uh, women, quote, unceremoniously plonking their breasts on the table, left, right, and center. Now, I know that they're often called jugs, but I think they were getting a bit confused there. <laughs> but what I really noticed, reading all this, is how often one word kept coming up over and over again, and that was the word reasonable. Because Claridge's requests were actually very reasonable for some people, because many people may potentially be embarrassed at the sight of somebody feeding a baby. It was unreasonable for that mother to take it for granted that everyone would find it acceptable. As most reasonable thinking people know, breastfeeding can be done discreetly. And Farage's statement, a lot of people agreed, was also really reasonable because he was only calling for compromise and accommodation on both sides. So I started thinking about what it means to be reasonable and how difficult it was for me in that set of circumstances, finding breastfeeding actually extremely difficult, to breastfeed in a way that everybody would consider to be reasonably discreet. And if everyone is drawing that line in a slightly different way, then how common can common sense really be? Amazing.
Thank you for that, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, I remember breastfeeding in a cafe once, and a friend had given me a shawl, and I had never tried it before. And up until that point, I hadn't felt self-conscious breastfeeding in public. But um, I put the shawl on, and um, then I did feel self-conscious because it was huge. And um, I overheard a child ask its parent, why is that lady dressed as a ghost? <laughs> um, uh, and from then I got my bosoms out. But um, do, um, when do, how do we evolve shame around breastfeeding in public? Surely that's something that we've cultivated in terms of society. Was it Victorians? That's my guess. That's a good guess. And actually, that's one of the things that I write about because one of what I really wanted to find out is the roots of what we consider to be reasonable behaviour mm. when we're sharing space with other people. Mm. And when, when it comes to the idea that women should be modest and discreet and covered up, in the Anglophone context at least, it's often believed that we owe that to the Victorians. That was definitely my assumption. But when I dug into the research, I found that that division actually has roots in much older traditions. Like, for example, Aristotle he reflected on the ideal split of Greek society into the home and the city. And throughout the centuries, the demand placed on women has been to artificially enhance their bodies in private to appear naturally beautiful, whilst pretending we're not doing anything at all because we just woke up like this. Mm. So it's small wonder, really, that some people still see feeding a child or maybe even applying a slick of mascara on public transport, which is one of the other things that I look at. People can be really upset about women applying makeup in public. It's small wonder that because we've been fed this line that women have to appear naturally beautiful and cover up and be modest and not show too much of themselves, that those things are still seen as a scandalously private act how, wow. how, so we've ended up with what you, you talk in the book about the social contract, which is what we sort of all expect. So something I would expect in the social contract, which I would never really think about until it's crossed. Yeah. We just, so if I'm on a tube and... You're right. Okay. <laughs> and there's lots of seats and someone gets on and sits right next to me. S when someone they, thought you'd breach the contract just by getting on the tube. <laughs> They're fainted. Someone th is everything okay? Yeah, great. great. Um, if somebody um, sits right next to me when yeah. there are, like, say the carriage was empty mm. except just for me and this person, they sat right next to me, to me that would be a grave crossing of the social contract or, or dis discounting of the social contract, which would make me fear, like, yeah. what's going on here? Because that's not normal, right? And like, no one's ever given you a lecture and told you don't sit next to somebody if there's a seat, if there's lots of... We just don't... There's so we much we don't, don't talk about. Also, some of that person might be... That person potentially... I don't know. It's oh, from a culture be... like we're... In London, we're so like, do not look at the person. Yeah, no, absolutely. But in, in... And they might be from somewhere where on public transport, of course, it'd be rude not to. And they're going to try and be Yeah, it would imply that you uh, yeah. want to be avoided or whatever. But those kinds of things, we often don't know what our social contracts are until they're contravened. Yeah. So in terms of ac an academic philosophical view of all this, can you unpack that a little bit more for yeah. us? Of course. So one of the things that I write about is how um, our distinction between private and public and intimate space actually has been found to vary quite wildly from culture mm. to culture. Mm. And, of course, there is no quantitative measure. There's no one singular centimetre point at which we've all decided to agree and told our children that this is the point where you're crossing over from public space into somebody's personal space. Mm. But we all register those things, and it's because of what we call superconscious mechanisms, which is the fact that a lot of what we know about the world comes down from top-down instruction, but a huge amount goes beyond consciousness and language. We aren't told how to behave. Uh, one of the things that I look at is how do we know how to cue? 
and British how... British people know. British people know. You Australians know don't know in the same way. We don't know. No, we don't know. I had and to I'm learn. Varies. I had to observe because I was like... We, I was so confused when I first got here. People would queue for a, the bus stop, but they're all getting on different buses. Yeah. And, and it standard. seems so simple. It's not normal. But just think about what happens really when you need to grab them. something else and you have to not leave the queue, but just slightly move away from the queue. Mm. How do you signal to other people mm. that you're definitely not leaving the queue? I do a kind of exaggerated lunch, much as you were demonstrating mm. earlier. Mm. Nobody taught us how to do these things. A Diane from Traitor's Lunch. Yeah. A Diane from Traitor's Lunch. And Just if a bodyweight lunch. If that was, that was, that was, that's that was done not in this episode, listeners, but it, it, uh, Jessica Foster, you did tonight, uh, live on stage, uh, lunch. And so you would do an exaggerated lunch. I would. Yeah. But we just know how to behave because we feel these rules in our bodies and under our skin, mm. which is why it can be so irksome yeah. when we feel that somebody else is breaking the rules, especially if they're not just getting away with it, but benefiting. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about the social contract, we need to think about the rules of behavior that really are benefiting all of us collectively because yeah. they're making public space better. and social life better safer, fairer, more equal for everybody. But also, when have those rules been made up to privilege only a certain slice of society yeah. and to keep the rest mm. of us down? The, one of the things there is, is that I think sometimes neuroatypical people would go, but why? Why not just say, or why not do this? What the assumption should be that if I come back, I should be, well, I don't know, I'm just making that up, but for every individual, it'll be different. But someone from a different culture, like when I got here from Australia, I was like, what the hell is going on? I couldn't make hide nor hair of it. Someone here from Australia, did you also find this weird queuing thing that they queue in weird ways here? Yeah, and now I know how to queue, still resent it. But, <laughs> Jess, what are you going to say? I think there's some ways in which, so I think we learn our social contracts from watching and joining in right generally mm. and being like you know eff effectively not wanting to upset anyone but also wanting to fit in and um and i wanted to feel upset and actually feeling upset by what's i've noticed oh it's a bit like my feelings about litter like a lot of my f feelings are they're not voluntary uh, and there's somewhere i think i think it's really interesting i'm watching the social contract change so but it hasn't stopped it doesn't mean I like it. And I'm trying to, I constantly, every time it happens, here's one. I think the social contract has changed on public transport in the UK about not using headphones if you're watching something loud or oh, listening to music. 100%. But it's just become something that just it's happens subtle. now. Yeah, just, and it's subtle. so loud and it fucks me off <laughs> because it feels so rude. Like it's so selfish. It's so individualistic. But... I do wonder whether, and I don't pipe up about it because I think, oh God, are you that old that you mind? Mm. I, my, I think, am I offended by that? Uh, it's another, give it another month and I'm going to be upset about rap music. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> is it my, I feel like that began as a young person's rebellion against the establishment, against the man, against authority, against arbitrary rule. I don't know, that felt like a teenager's way mm. of to me but maybe I'm wrong I don't know so I think mm, maybe it just needs to run its course but I, oh, I mean I'm inches away from when it's a middle aged couple I think you want a kick <laughs> everyone can hear that everyone else can hear that I'm trying to concentrate I'm trying to relax I'm trying, like I don't know yeah. no, we I, all have I, an arrangement to sort of pretend you're, we're all each other aren't there well there's don't also we? a thing of the social contract being don't stand up on a train and go hey we're all trying to read our own things or you know and it's it's really loud and as an Australian again sometimes I will try and do it in a charming way often British people sit on it until they boil over and then they, yeah. they get really angry and they go will you turn off whereas I cut it off at the past I think I see that happening and there was one there was a kid on a train and his thing was kept going good job uh oh good job uh -oh. oh no and it was we got on in London and we were going to Edinburgh did and the I child like, oh, survive <laughs> People were tutting for England, and for England being the operative country. Yeah. So I just stood up and said, oh, excuse me. And he was sitting a seat away from his dad. And I said to his dad, I said, oh, would your son have any headphones? And he went, he can put them on if he wants. He doesn't have to. And so I said to the little boy, do you have any headphones? Could you put them on? And I was really, really nice. And I said, it's just, it's just a quite a long trip to Edinburgh. 
And the man said, well, we're getting off at York. I was like, oh my God, and everyone went, York? Like that. But everyone loved that I did say something yeah, about yeah, and gave yeah. it a college try. <laughs> Kirsty, explain the phenomenon we are experiencing. <laughs> It's tempting to say that this is something new that's happening since lockdown. I've heard mm -hmm. a lot of people suggest that maybe we've forgotten how to behave. But actually, this has been going on for a very long time. And I don't want to get too nerdy, but... Please do. I trace the roots of what I call the disconnection economy, that system of political and social media and capitalism that together has been conspiring into encouraging us into individualistic modes of thinking about ourselves and our own needs rather than communitarian mm. models of thinking about what is best for everybody collectively, that really started to worsen around the 1970s with the rise of that neoliberal system, Margaret Thatcher's famous soundbite, there's no such thing as society. It's Thatcher's fault that people don't have headphones on the chain. <laughs> <laughs> but it's individualism then, because mm. yeah. it is, isn't it? It's the same thing. I hadn't put that together, but like playing your, like your uh -oh. watching your bad job. Uh oh, <laughs> bad job. Or they, like, I was on a train recently to all the way to Scotland, that, and some just a couple were just watching an action film full volume, and it was like, oh fuck it, wow, <laughs> <laughs> I got him, I found, I got him. <laughs> fuck that. Thatcherites. I yeah. also... It's the same thing as dropping litter. Like, the idea is, yes. I'm the only person here. I'm the only person here. Or someone has a job to deal with that. Yeah. Like, it's as if you are alone on this universe. Mm. The same mindset, mm -hmm. isn't it? I yeah. say to people, if they've dropped litter in Camden, and it's, Camden's my patch, yeah. so I wouldn't say it in the West End, but in Camden I feel, this is my living room. So do you know what I say? Oh, I think you've dropped this. And yeah. I give it back to them. And I've, a social contract, they never, ever look me in the eye and go, no, I meant to. They go, oh, sorry, did I? And then they put it in their pocket or their bag. <laughs> because it's a kind, charming way, I think, if a little passive-aggressive, yeah. of going, not... And then like do, you, Deb, do you follow them and go, and now say sorry? <laughs> <laughs> or, how do you, or how do you let it go? I'm not paying them five thousand pounds not to this fair play. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and I feel if you gave me five grand, I bet they stopped dropping the litter. A little, it's a lot of money for me, and it's just a little. It's a lot of money for anyone. It's a fucking little, you know. But there is a tendency to think about social censure and judgment and shame as if they are purely bad things that we must resist mm -hmm. doing to each other, particularly other than tatting mm. in the UK, but. What I look at in the book is the moment is it when worse those to things tut are actually... to go. <laughs> 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 Academically <laughs> speaking, dinosaur doctor. noises yeah. Yeah. are more reasonable than tutting. Doctor Sedgman certainly taking the passive out yeah. of the aggressive. But actually, shame can be really good. In fact, it's a necessary social tool. Get um, in. The, in fact, the entire evolution of human society goes back around about 10,000 years ago to the development not of not just of tools, but of pro-social rules and norms. Mm. The idea that actually on balance, probably it's better to trust that stranger in the distance rather than shooting with a poisoned arrow. That was only possible, and our ability to live collectively together in complex societies was mm. only possible because we decided that we were going to put in place shared social norms, mm. along with mechanisms for calling out people when those norms are broken. But I also called somebody out on a train fairly recently because they were getting, and it was a group of teenage boys, there was a baby crying, and they were getting very performatively, loudly angry at the baby. Oh, and it was okay. escalating into abusive language. And I saying, turned around. Fuck the baby. But I guess what oh. they were trying to do was shame that mother into, I don't know what, hurling the baby yeah. out of the window. Putting I headphones turned around on it. to him. Yep. And said, you don't know how hard it is to be a mother. <laughs> <laughs> and to his credit, he apologised. Yeah. Can I get his number? I'd like to hear an apology. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I let that escalate. It's one of those things. Um, can I ask, in your book, you talk about the stats about sexual violence against Ooh, women yeah. and the injustice that's there. Um, 
Can you unpack a little bit about what you found as an academic about the origins of this? Of course. So in recent years, um, rape reports around the world have been increasing exponentially, but rape convictions have remained relatively static, and that's called the justice gap. So I started to look into why this is. And one of the things that I found is that when the legal system, the international legal system was being developed, they needed to figure out a way of applying what seems like rigid rules to actually very variable sets of social circumstances, figuring out who did what to whom within what context is not as black and white as it appears. So they reached for an old philosophical word, and that word was reasonable. They invented what's called the reasonable standard of judgment, and that's applied in court, courtrooms around the world today. But in its earliest iteration, it was called the reasonable man standard. Our audience hasn't enjoyed that. <laughs> And my problem here is not with men. It's not even with the upper middle class, white, rich men who tended to make up the elite and whose judgments were considered to be the only reasonable ones. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that that one tiny segment of society should be equipped to be the ultimate objective arbiter of judgment of everybody else. And I explore in the book all the ways that this plays out from the um, idea of the uh, reasonable doubt, which is in murder trials, that use of reasonable is, of course, central there, to that infamous get cops out of jail free card, the reasonable use of force, but also how reasonableness has played out in cases of sexual violence against women. Mm. And what I find is that time and time again, those supposedly reasonable judgments tend to have lent themselves to victim blaming because of centuries of, we call them schemata, basically stories that have been told about women as the um, evil temptresses from Eve to the uh, Chang dynasties, incubi, these stories that have been told about women as if they are corrupting men who are hapless and can't help themselves. And I've got a lovely list from a letter written by a Benedictine monk called Peter Damien in 1064. He sent his fellow clergymen a long list of all the things that he believed women were like. So ladies and anyone who wants to, tag yourselves. <laughs> Appetizers of the devil. Venom of minds poison of drinkers, toxin of banqueters, screech owls, uh, wolves, leeches, whores, prostitutes, lovers, mad vipers who, because of impatience of the burning lust of your loves, mutilate Christ, wallows of greasy pigs. And women were seen as such a threat, because as Peter Damien pointed out, um, for a very long time, women were believed to be corrupting men's souls by seducing them into having sex with them. Which is why we can see those ancient, wrong-headed, supposedly reasonable beliefs cropping up in courtrooms again and again around the world that tend to blame women and let the male perpetrators, who are always promising young men with bright futures ahead of them, off the hook. That doesn't sound too reasonable to me. What hearing that list has done is it once put to us, it was made me want to start a feminist gang called Mad Vipers. Um, we could get jackets, it'd be cool. Um, oh, yeah. But the, the, the book really goes into uh, all sorts of, there's a chapter called Fuck Civility, but it's about the way that groups who have fought for social progress, they can't just go, well, we'll meet you at what is reasonable now. You kind of have to create a new reasonable through social progress. And some of those ways are involve things that are revolution or, you know, they're, you have to go out in the street and you have to appear very unreasonable. Um, so interesting. And if you, I really recommend that you read the book because what is reasonable, what, what is reasonable in the social contract is what we've all decided is reasonable. And sometimes 
the people that are most important in a certain conversation didn't get to decide yeah. what was reasonable within that. Um, one thing I do want to ask you, though, is I feel like there's a lot of unreasonableness. So especially on social media, someone will say something, someone else will come in and go, well, you shouldn't say that because the first person will get a bit defensive and then it will escalate so unreasonably, so quickly. And instead of sort of chatting someone through something or walking, someone who's effectively on your side, instead of walking someone through it and let, also letting them disagree for a while and think about it. Sometimes people don't, they're proud and they don't want to say right away. But instead of saying, look, I, I think one technique that I've used in the past is go, look, I thought that, I didn't understand it either, but I read this and I thought it was really interesting. And I think if you read it, you might change your mind. You might not, but you might. And I feel like this is my reasonable person technique of like, I, a reasonable person, change my mind you might too but I also do want to allow some space for plurality what if they read it and they don't change their mind I don't want everyone who's on my team to just think exactly the same as me about everything mm. so where's the other side of this which is reasonable does doesn't have to mean everybody agreeing with you about everything either does it it doesn't and one of the big things that I know could be a risk of writing a book like this is I might he seemed to be claiming to be the ultimate arbiter of reasonableness. The only person in the world who is able to tell everybody else what is right and what is wrong. Oh, the good, then in that, that case, making... what do you think about my dentist story? <laughs> you could be the judge. I think you should yell at her. Oh, it's official. Yeah, I definitely wasn't a frozen vote there. But... Arbit arbiter of, arbiter of, international arbiter of reasonableness. But I'm says, not. But no, of because... course not. Because... Yes. We're talking yeah. about some of the most complex issues of yeah. social relations here. Mm -hmm. We want to live in this multi-generational, multicultural democracy. Mm -hmm. But we have all of these competing views and ideas. And we have all of these forces that are deliberately trying to pull us apart. And social media is a big part of that problem. I call it the, um, the bait and bitch technique. Bait and bitch? Yeah, not bait and switch. Ah. It's a clever pun. <laughs> Okay, maybe it wasn't that clever. No, it is, a good, it is a good pun. And what that means is that we know that social media is designed more often than not to encourage dissenting voices, mm. to encourage dissensus and angry debate, because that's where the big bucks are. There's much more money to be made from encouraging hate than there is encouraging healthy and nourishing forms of conversation. Why is that? Just because you stay on longer if you're angry with someone and then you see more ads? Yeah, and there's so many... More quickly. There's so much research that shows that um, engagement farming yeah. really does work. Hate clicks. It spreads people more quickly than any other emotion. across. Tend to want to click on things or to write about things that make them angry because they want to publicly disagree. And also, one of the things that I talk about is the fact that we are being hit with so much information mm. now more than ever. And it can be really confusing mm. and actually quite distressing. We're seeing more information than our grandparents would, I think, in, well, quite a long time. And we're seeing that every day beamed into our eyeballs. So having an opinion and publicly affirming that opinion, often on social media, can be a way to, I argue restore that sense of order in a chaotic mm. universe and also mm. fight and for powerful, the social yeah. contract as you see it. Yes, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And feel heard. and Yeah, and yeah. try to make society better. Mm. But we also have seen the dark side of that in the infamous Karen videos, for example, when somebody mm. has that strong sense of reasonable self-righteousness and is approaching somebody, usually it's a white woman approaching a person of colour and shaming them as if they're the manager of that social space. And that mm. terrifying thrill of reasonableness in the eyes has been judged by so many people around the world to be manifestly unreasonable because they're causing harm and making judgments based on bias. Mm. So what... Can I reasonably point out your 10 minutes over? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> the battery so, went, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so just very quickly... And I'm not sure, actually, This is the last thing, but is there, is there any hope for us? Yes. Oh, God, imagine if you said no. <laughs> <laughs> What's the hope? Really, you What's... left a little dangly moment there, and I... Yeah. I was nervous. What, uh, what, it's, it's true, you paused for too long. What's the hope... Uh, what's the hope that what's we can take hope? away from your book? The hope is that we are living in a society. I believe in society. I believe that 
humans, broadly speaking, are more good and collaborative and cooperative than we are combative. We've been incentivized into divisions. And what we need to do is ask ourselves not, should we do away with rules altogether? Um, I call those people the unreasonably unreasonable people, people who feel that they should be able to smash things and get their own way and take whatever they want, no matter the harm to anyone else. We want to censure and shame those people. But also, I worry that a lot of us are so worried of seeming like them that we've become something not worse, but maybe just as bad. And those people I call unreasonably reasonable, obsessed with tone policing, an endless, toothless debate, cultivating the appearance of reasonableness, whilst actually allowing morally unjust things to pass. And what history shows us, as I carefully unpick in the book, is that history has always relied on the reasonably unreasonable people, people who know that sometimes, sometimes under the right kinds of circumstances, we need to give other people permission to pull down statues and to shut down hate speech. Because only then are we going to move forwards together towards true social progress. Dr. Kirsty Sedgman, it's been an absolute honour. I would recommend everyone buy and read on Being Unreasonable. The paperback has a, a cross-looking bunny on the front, so how can you resist it. that? It's it would be unreasonable cover. of you not to buy it. Um, no, it's really, really, really is interesting. And it's good to, re- it's good to think these things apart mm. sometimes. I think we get locked in a very mm. unhealthy rigid way of going no one can go forward unless this and then well we're all not going to go forward yet so i think it's a really this book is a really useful tool in rethinking uh, uh how to be how to be unreasonably reasonable um kirsty uh this is what you came to plug i assume it is anything else to plug um only to say that the reason i was so excited to come on this podcast is my husband's massive fan listened to guilty feminist for years first episode he ever listened to he burst into the kitchen and he said kirsty have you heard about this thing called the gender pay gap and i was like uh yes i've been telling you about this for years so we have a running joke that if i want him to listen to me i just need to go on the guilty feminist so now i'm here i'm just going to spend the next two hours listing all the things that i want you to listen to tom uh the boys pe days this term on monday and thursday <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Kirsty Zedgeman, everybody. Woo-hoo! Absolutely brilliant. What a brilliant guest. Um, Jess Foster Q, have you got anything to plug? I've got two things to plug. Um, I forgot one of them in the last episode. Um, I've got two things to plug. My last show, Wench, is out as a special. Oh. And um, it's out on the 26th of January. Um, but you can already pre-order it and it's paid what you want to stream it. Um, and I'm on tour with a brand new show called Metal all over the UK and Ireland. And I'd really love to have Guilty Feminist listeners in my audiences. Hopefully it's coming somewhere near where you live. Nice. Um, <laughs> very, very excited. Please, please. Go along to all of If you're of here in London, things. it's at the Leicester Square Theatre in June. It's also at Soho Theatre in February, but I think it's sold out. Oh, very good. Uh, you've been an absolutely fantastic audience. Uh, I'm just going to say a big thank you to everyone at King's Place. <laughs> Sorry, we've run over a bit. Thank you to Dr. Kirsty Sedgman. <laughs> and thank you to the incredible Jessica Vostagul. <laughs> You have been listening to Guilty Feathers with me, Deborah Brussels White, guest host, Jess Foster Q, and our very special guest, Dr. Kirsty Sedgman. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The Guilty Feathers theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Slitsky for the Spotted Age Shop. Thanks to Rachel Craft, Regina Dinsa, Zaina Mahmoud, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeathers.com. Well, Olga Cox should take it to the dragons. It's her game. Olga Cox already taken it to the dragons, and uh, I think we helped develop they've it. They've already, yeah. Well, of course, we are a part of the development package because yeah. of our excellent work on it. Um, yeah, uh, Deborah Meaden's already signed up uh, for five percent of. <laughs> I'm over my Olga Cox as my. I'm over my ex. 
yeah. um, for uh, only... Uh, five, uh, five, She's uh, given us 10, ten mil for, for just 2%, 2 of, the of the business. business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was the most successful pitch that's ever been on the den. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is quite a fun game. I think we're all going to be playing it for ages. Um, I bet it helps, though. I bet it does. Because then you just think, well, how, I feel should, better. Well, how have I made that happen? Good. Mm -hmm. Do you know, you, know, like when you, you know like when you wake up and you go, hmm. have I dreamed that? Or has it happened? Oh, it's a bit like that. Disappointing moment. It's, you're with John that little moment. <laughs> no, I have a moment, number of times I thought I, we were really good friends or out on a date. So. You wake up and you go, friends. oh, I think it's finally happened. And then it turns out. So. Um, Hasn't again. All right. I'm going to say live from Two Space Love. Yeah. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.